Thanks very much. It's good to be here and um, good to be joining the U.S. Chamber for the first Global Aerospace Summit. My name is Charlie Bolden, for those of you who may not know me. Um, and I'm here with Peter Beck, the CEO and founder of uh, Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab was founded in 2006 in New Zealand and has since moved its headquarters here to Huntington Beach, Long Beach, One Beach in California back in 2013. Uh, before we get into the formal questions, oh, Peter, I have a trivial question for you. What in the world is a rocket-powered contraption? Since in your Wikipedia it said you spent your young days building rocket-powered contraptions. I always, always figured that the, the best test of your, uh, your, your rocket qualities is to put a leg either side of it. So uh, I built rocket bikes, rocket packs, rocket scooters, um, in, in my misspent youth. Are you using any of them today? No. No, okay. Well, Rocket Lab manufactures spacecraft, satellite components. They also provide satellite launch and, and on-orbit management services. Their prime launch vehicle, I, th I think, is, um, is Electron. Correct. Um, and just recently, they launched the NASA Capstone uh, lunar mission on its way, and we can talk a little bit about that. And their cargo carrier is Photon. Uh, unique, he uniquely employs uh, a 3D built, 3, 3D printed uh, rocket engine. So uh, I'm very interested in that. L let's start about uh, Capstone. Capstone uh, satellite launched on June 28, 2022, and, and uh, you and I both have great hopes for its mm. success. Um, you want to talk a little bit about it and how you got involved with them? Yeah, so, so Capstone was a really interesting mission. Um, so it's really divided um, in, into a, a number of different partners. So our part of the mission was to, to, to launch the Capstone spacecraft, uh, put it in low Earth orbit, and then our photon um, high energy stage uh, did a series of orbit raising maneuvers and then finally sent it off onto a, its TLI trajectory into the moon. Uh, at that point, we separated off the Capstone spacecraft, and it's uh, it's going off and, and doing its doing its thing there. It was it's an important mission because it's the first part of obviously the the Artemis program, yeah. and it's important to test out you know the NRH, NRHO orbit. Um, but what we're most excited about it is you know that was a ten million dollar contract, so the capability that we've created there now is for some tens of millions of dollars we can send you to the moon, we can send you to Mars, we can send you to Venus. And it opens up a whole new era of kind of low-cost uh, planetary science expeditions. Several of the panels so far today have talked a little bit about the importance of public-private mm. partnerships. And you and I backstage were, I was saying in my mind, Capstone is a perfect example of the public-private partnership where NASA buys a service. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the, pick one of the three companies I, I happen to like Advanced Space, which is the, the manager of the project. but. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and the way the project came about is really advanced space came up with these, these very unique kind of uh, orbit determination techniques, uh, and, and, you know, a little, a little company really kind of primed the mission, uh, and, and then all of the other industry partners, you know, there, there was us and, and a couple of others all came together to, to execute that mission. But to your point, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a NASA-led uh, kind of, um, you know, prime mission. It was, it was very much a, a small business-led mission. And as you and I talk, the reason we think it's critically important is because NASA's put this small business in the critical path for mm -hmm. Artemis, because what we hope to learn from that will be critical for the success of Artemis. Um, you know, space flight's traditionally been a, a government-led endeavor, but um, the landscape's changed quite a bit. And um, last year at this conference, I think you um, you mentioned the, the point you spoke to the opportunities for commercial sector to partner with the public sector. Mm -hmm. How critical are government partnerships for the future of space exploration and space sustainability? I, I think it's absolutely critical and I think there's a clear, clear kind of uh, dividing line between things that, that commercial entities like us can't make a business case for, that's when the government needs to step in and do. But once there's a business case established, that's when the government should step out and allow industry to come in and, and provide those services at best value and, and, and best cost. But you know, if I think back through Rocket Lab's history, it's just it's peppered with all of these partnerships, whether it be 
you know, in our own missions we've done and partnered with, um, the, the NASA VCLS contract, one of the very first launches that we actually did, mm -hmm. was a great example of, of a NASA Rocket Lab partnership where um, we were just a little tiny company at that point. We had no proven technology at all. And NASA partnered with us and, um, and gave us a contract to, you know, to launch something, which, you know, when I look back on, was quite formative for the company because it enabled us to take that NASA stamp and go and raise venture capital. Great. You know, in May, Rocket Lab caught a falling, well, my term, caught. Uh, you, you, you captured for a while um, yep. a falling first stage rocket with a helicopter in midair uh, before it came loose and mm -hmm. went into the ocean. But the point was made. It, it was the first attempt at recovering rocket launches from space by helicopter. This was key um, to Electron Program's milestones and uh, in making your launch systems reusable. Can you talk a little bit more about your upcoming dry landing, refueling, and launching tests uh, that we might expect later this year? Yeah, so, um, you know, Electron is a small launch vehicle, and in a small launch vehicle, there, there just is no margins. So really the only viable way um, to do reusability is to, as you say, is let, let the atmosphere do the work and capture it with a helicopter. Um, and, and kind of we, we proved that that was possible and it's, it's kind of easy to, everyone thinks that like catching it media with a helicopter is, is the James Bond moment where it's all, that's the hardest part. Actually the hardest part is it, it launched 400 kilometers away, traveled mark, you know, seven and a half times the speed of sound and then we had to rendezvous exactly at the right point in the right time with the helicopter. That was actually the, you know, the tricky bit. But what that means now is that we can literally capture that thing, fly it back to the land, refuel it, and go again, which yeah. is, which is, you know, reusability is, is, is just such a game changer. Okay. You know, here in the U.S., we're always talking about kids have to go to college, have to go to college. You didn't go to college. You were, you're self-educated post high school. But given that, and the fact that you have two kids, 10 years old and 13, mm. is that right? Yep. How do we inspire um, you know, young people to fill the STEM pipeline and sustain yeah. the growth of science and research uh, for that community? So, so my pathway was unusual in the fact that you know, I, I, I came from a, a tiny little town at the bottom of the South Island in New Zealand. And New Zealand had no space industry. So you know, I, I was growing up watching NASA TV. And you know, my, my kind of... Uh, options were, were, were really limited, and, and my, my educational choices, you know, I went and did a tool and die making apprenticeship because if I went to university, nobody's teaching me about rockets. Um, you know, I, I, I understand the principles here, but the bit that I was lacking is I needed to build these things. So I followed a kind of a non-traditional career in, 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 in that sense. Um, but as, as I kind of, you know, think forward, we, we have a real talent shortage within the industry. And you know, at Rocket Lab, we run apprenticeship programs. We have you know a whole education program, and we've visited uh, 150 schools, and we've got 11 and a half thousand kids signed up to our Space Ambassadors program. Mm -hmm. And we learned very early on that there's no point in targeting high schools, because by the time the kids are at high schools, kind of they've already decided what they want to do, or it's already been beaten out of them that they can't have dreams. So we, we found that we go to the primary schools and we, we kind of use the rocket as the inspiration. But teach them two things. We, we, we teach them, obviously, you know, there's a strong angle of STEM, but um, we, we teach them that you don't have to sign up to, to go and do a job. Like, follow your passion. If you want to create a business, go and create it. Uh, so we teach entrepreneurialism just as much as we, we try and promote STEM in, in those programs. I, I applaud what you're doing because I'm one who happens to believe that you know, NASA, when I was there, uh, the vast majority of the population in the NASA workforce is not engineers and scientists. Uh, and we could not survive without them. And I, I think what you're doing is just perfect. Um, responsive access to space, yep. uh, very quickly. Um, you're now working on a responsive space program to get satellites into space faster and on shorter notice. This is obviously appealing to the defense uh, customers. To what do you attribute Rocket Lab success? And, and what does that tell you about the small and mid-sized satellite and launch market um, more broadly? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a very common topic, um, responsive access to space. And uh, we kind of chuckle because we, we do it like just about every launch. Um, you know, we've, we've had a customer come to us five weeks before launch and go, hey, can you get this on orbit? 
um, and you know, getting through all the licensing process. Uh, we just did two back-to-back -back missions for the NRO, so responsive space exists. Um, but if you don't have the satellite, it's all kind of a bit pointless having the rocket sitting on the pad. So our kind of you know, message to everybody and, and, and the bit that we focus on, and the reason why we're not just a rocket company is because um, if, if, if you've just got the rocket there, you're only half the equation. So true responsive access to space is the satellite and the rocket coming together you know, to deliver a capability. Rocket Lab um, advertises that you're going to do on-orbit management. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you envision that being. Are we talking about grabbing satellites and deorbiting them, or grabbing satellites and refurbishing them, or what, what's the long-range vision? So the, the, I guess the, the, the longer-range vision is we're trying to build an end-to-end -end space company. So um, launch, is, launch is really enabling, it's the keys to space. So you can't do anything without the keys to space. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we've kind of solved that problem. Now we've moved into the spacecraft arena where we're solving that problem. And then the kind of the end point is just providing services. And we already find today a customer will come to us and they'll have a concept for a satellite and they'll want to buy a reaction wheel or you know, some component from us. And quite often those conversations will end up in, you know what, this space gig looks pretty hard, um, so can you just provide us the service rather than um, sell us parts? So I think that's ultimately where the model is going to go, is people are going to provide services rather than individual parts. And Great. Mm. This next question I have, I'm hoping uh, I can get it in in the time yep. we have left. It's a long question, and I'm going to read it. Um, over the past year, Rocket Lab has, been significant, it has seen significant expansion and diversification in its space systems business, led by Sol Aero product line. Um, the Q2 numbers show that space systems contributed about 36.4 million, or 66% of the total quarterly revenue. Uh, rocket Lab's poised to continue that trajectory following NASA's selection of Rocket Lab to manufacture the solar array panel for NASA's Glide spacecraft in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Where do you hope to see Rocket Lab's space systems business by this time next year? Be careful what you wish for, man. Um, so uh, the, the space systems part of the business has, has grown um, enormously, and uh, it's 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 really all about making it simple. It's it's about um, you know creating capability and providing a you know solutions in the in the in the simplest way. So um, yep, we, we've experienced uh, a, a lot of a lot of growth there, but um, you know ultimately you know what what we're trying to achieve here is is to kind of lower the barriers to entry for you know for everybody to get you know capability on orbit. Okay. Um, as the owner of a rocket company, what's the one thing that bugs you the most uh, about, about conducting your business? How do you, uh, how do you, diff and, and we were talking about capstone. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. How do you differentiate for the, the uninitiated in the, what, where's the break in responsibility for a particular mission? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, the, the, yeah. So when, when, you, when you're a part of these larger missions and you're, you're, you're part of an, uh, an element of many, if one element lets it down, then kind of you get the, just as bad PR as, 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 as the element that let it down. But I think um, uh, kind of more, more broadly, um, this, this, the, the, the thing I love about the space industry and the thing that, I, that frustrates me about the space industry is, is the same thing. So in the space industry, you can stand up in this stage and say, I'm going to land someone on Mars, and or um, you, you're going to go and do the most amazing thing, and everybody, everybody stands up and applauds and just goes, yep, that's going to happen. Um, and that's the most amazing thing. The, the, the frustrating thing is that um, there's a lot of aspirations in space, but a little bit shy on execution. And it's great to have these, uh, these hugely ambitious dreams, and, and, and we, we, we all love it, but um, the, the, one of the challenges is that, um, you know, at some point in time you have to execute in space. Space is not easy to execute in. Gotcha. Ten years from now, um, how big will Rocket Lab, how big, how big a rocket will Rocket Lab be launching? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we've got the Neutron vehicle, which is, which is a pretty significant vehicle. It's, you know, 13 tons to low Earth orbit. Um, ten years is a very long time horizon in, in, in Rocket Lab. Uh, it's often joked that, that you know, one year at Rocket Lab is like dog years. It, it seems like many, many more years. Um, we get a lot done in one year. So uh, in 10 years' time, um, you know, if we continue the trajectory, uh, I, I think um, uh, we hopefully we'll have had some pretty significant impact in the world. 
Well, I think you've had pretty significant impact already. You know, when I look at the success rate that you have in the number of launches per year, that's pretty impressive. So um, congratulations. Touch some wood somewhere. Well, I know, knock on wood. <laughs> um, but never, never, never get too cocky in the space industry. Well, you, trust me, you're absolutely right. But thanks very much for spending time with us thanks, today. Charlie. Thanks to all of you again for coming out, and uh, I think we'll, well, Carol, we didn't give you any time back. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks.